Hello, my friends. This is module number two, part one, intrapartum. Um, this is going to take us up to some, some of the labor, um, but I'm going to stop before the fetal monitoring. The fetal monitoring will all be in the second part of this lecture. I wanted to include, I've actually finished this lecture, but I wanted to come back and mention here at the beginning that I do understand that this is a foreign language, that these concepts are all totally different than anything you've ever done. And um, what I do want to emphasize though, is that you do need to be here and you need um, for all these lectures, you need to be um, here and participating when we're doing virtual class um, because you are going to miss something and a lot of this stuff um, needs a visual, a visual explanation and it needs me to be able to interpret it a bit better for you a bit more. Um, so the idea of these lectures is for you to hear this information that first time, take some good notes, and then when we get to class we're going to go back over it again and discuss and I will show you some things, lots of videos, um, that will hopefully make these things make sense to you. So please make sure you're very cautious about your attendance. These are our learning outcomes. This will be for this lecture as well as for the next lecture. Um, I did not repeat the slide so um, for the second half, but this is um, what we're going to be discussing. Okay, so we are going to be talking about the intrapartum period. So that is the actual um, labor process in childbirth um, until the delivery of the placenta. Once placenta is out, we're moved then into the postpartum period. Okay, so signs of impending labor. These are things that can happen. Does that mean it's going to happen with every single pregnant person? Absolutely not. But these are things that you might see, okay, um, in some terms. So um, lightning. So that means that the baby's going to start um, what you'll hear people say dropping. So that um, pelvic, those pelvic bones, they get some of that relaxing hormone. Those bones start to open up so that baby can start dropping down um, and be beginning its um, descent through um, the cervix and vagina and all those, those areas we must go through in order to deliver, okay? Um, Braxton Hicks are irregular contractions. They do not um, result in any kind of cervical change. This is what we, can, what we call false labor. Um, a lot of the, the um, literature will say that these are not painful contractions, and I find that to be true and not true, okay? So um, usually you'll have some of these, um, maybe when you're say 33, 34, 35 weeks, those you won't even necessarily feel other than you can feel that your belly feels tight on and off, on and off, um, but it doesn't result in a cramping pain. Now, as you get closer to the end, um, you will have some uncomfortable cramping um, pain and they still can be these Braxton Hicks. So it really kind of depends on what stage we're at. Um, the big deal is with this is that cervix does not make any change. So that's how we know if you're in real labor or if you're in um, false labor, okay? So cervical changes. So that cervix is usually long and um, closed. So in order for um, baby to come out, the cervix has to change, okay? So it has to become softer um, and it has to start dilating, okay? So um, all these things have to happen in order for um, baby to come out. Um, nesting is another thing that you will see in these ladies right before delivery, um, whether it really means you're gonna go into labor or not, Maybe, or maybe it's just your body knowing that, you know, soon you're going to have a baby. Let me go ahead and get this done. But
but it's that final kind of burst of energy. I need to make sure my house is in order. I have to make sure the nursery's ready. I got to pack my bag. All those kind of things happen. Um, you can have some bloody show, which is sometimes a brown or blood tinged um, mucus that people will start noticing. If those are, are combined with some really good contractions, then that may be the um, precursor to labor. Okay, so some of the things that affect labor are the five P's. All right, we will talk about these a lot more in class. Um, I'm trying to just kind of hit the highlights. Our classroom time is going to be very extensive, so we're gonna have a lot of time to really go through these things and break them down a bit more for you. Um, so labor is defined by uterine, con uterine contractions that make you have some sort of cervical change. What am I talking about? Okay, so um, your term. So I'm at 38, 39 weeks. I'm starting to have some contractions. I do some walking, they get closer. I decide I'm gonna to go to labor and delivery and see is this really labor or is this false labor? Um, so I get put on the monitor and the um, labor nurse is gonna check my cervix. So they're, they're checking for how thin is the cervix, that's effacement, and how dilated is the cervix and that's how open it is, okay? So we usually go ahead and get you on the monitor and check your cervix right away. Then we kind of monitor you, let you rest for about an hour or so. Then we recheck your cervix, okay? Why am I doing this twice? Because in order to really be what we considered in labor, you should have some sort of cervical change within each hour, okay? So either that cervix is even more thin, it's more dilated, it's more open, those are the things that we are looking for. So how, do, how does this happen? So we call them the five P's of labor. Um, so if there's a issue with any one of these five P's, then we may end up having to go to an operative delivery, meaning a C-section or um, there are a few vaginal operative deliveries that we can do. So powers are our contractions. The passage is the pelvis and, and birth canal. Passenger is the baby. The psyche is the response of the woman. And then position is um, how well is mom able to move around so we can get labor process going. And we will discuss these more in class, I promise. All right, when we're talking about labor, there are four stages of labor. So our first stage is um, actually starts um, at the beginning of regular contractions and goes until mom is completely dilated. So when I say she's completely dilated, that means she's 10 centimeters and she's completely effaced. So she's 100%, okay? We're gonna get to that more as we go through, okay? So just hang with me. Um, so there are three phases of labor. Um, you have that latent phase. In that latent phase, you go from zero to three or so, three to four. Um, this At this stage, you're kind of, mom is kind of excited. Things are going well, right? I'm gonna have a baby. This is, I'm uncomfortable during contractions, but not too bad. Um, so that's kind of your latent phase. Your active phase is four to seven CMs. Typically, this is where you're gonna see mom um, Things are going to be getting a bit more intense. Contractions are closer together. They're longer. Um, I'm probably going to want an epidural in this time, time period. And then that transition phase is 8 to 10. So in that transition phase, um, if she doesn't have an epidural, you may hear requests for pain medications of some sort. Um, so we will um, kind of assess, assess how quickly labor is going before we decide what can we do as far as pain medication? Um, our second stage of labor is when the patient is 10 until um, the baby delivers. So that's um, 10 CMs to, through the pushing stage, okay? Your third stage of labor is delivery of baby and delivery of placenta. 
And then your fourth stage of labor is your recovery period, which is usually about two hours after the delivery of the placenta. Um, so again, this slide discusses the difference between true and false labor. Um, and remember that all these things aren't necessarily true. People are all gonna experience these things differently. So the big thing, the big way we know the difference between true and false labor is cervical change. So this is a nice little um, chart that breaks down that latent active and transition phase of that first stage of labor. Um, so that really kind of tells you what happens in those different um, stages. Okay, signs of labor and early labor. So things that we're always going to assess um, are the status of our membrane. So if our patient comes in thinking that their water broke, we're going to assess for that. We're gonna listen for our fetal heart tones. Um, we're going to um, possibly have these signs of labor that we've talked about already, your lightning, your Braxton Hicks, all of those kind of things. Um, and then we as nurses are going to perform a VAG exam when they get there um, to decide, um, see what the cervix is doing, where's baby at, um, and look for a presenting part. When I say a presenting part, I'm looking for what, what piece of the baby, which part is coming first. Um, they don't always come head first, right? Sometimes an arm will come first, sometimes a foot will come first, sometimes a butt will come first, sometimes it's a shoulder. So depending on what's going on, I'm looking for the presentation of the baby. All right, my cervical assessment. So um, these are the things that I am going to be assessing when I'm checking my patient, okay? Um, so I'm going to look for the di dilatation or how far is that cervix dilated. So um, it can be zero, which is closed, to 10 cm's, which is completely um, dilated. Um, for cervical effacement, I'm looking for it to shorten. Um, and as it shortens, it also is going to get thinner. Um, our cervix, I'm going to be um, assessing for, is it anterior or posterior? Um, so sometimes if you come in and maybe it's my first baby, um, I'm not really in good labor yet. Um, when we go to do our vaginal exam, that cervix may be very much, um, the baby's head will be down and the cervix actually is kind of behind it. Um, so, um, you can you can feel it, but it's very it can be very very difficult. Um, so if you are a mom and had to experience this, if you go if you had gone in um, for an exam and they made you put your fists underneath your butt to kind of lift you up some, that's what they're trying to feel. That cervix is in the back. Um, so that cervix has become soft where it was firm before. Um, we're looking for the location of the presenting part in the pelvis. Um, if our baby is at station zero, that means that head is, is nicely engaged into that pelvic area, those pelvic bones. If it's a minus two, then it's above um, the pelvic bones. If it's plus two, then that means that head is now descending through those pelvic bones and I'm starting to see baby um, or be able to feel baby very easily. And then presentation, I'm looking for what part of the baby is coming out first. Um, so if we're saying that baby is a vertex, that means baby is head down. Okay, effacement. So when I talk about the cervix thinning, um, this is, um, what is called effacement. So looking at our picture here on the right, this is A, B, and C. So this very long um, piece of tissue, right, with the um, shortened canal there in between. I'm trying to think of how to, 
how to make these pictures make sense. Um, so that is the cervix. You can see it's long, right, and very thick. In B, it is now thinned out, but it's it's not open anymore. Okay, and then in C, it's thinned out and it's opened. Okay, so those are the things that we're looking at. How do I check these things? Well, I use two fingers um, and I do a badge exam. You know, my, my fingers go into the vagina and I'm feeling for cervical opening and um, presenting part, all that good stuff. Okay, dilation or dilatation, what am I looking for? So this is a nice picture here on how far am I dilated by saying this, this is um, taking um, everyday objects and kind of seeing that this is, this is what it relates to. Um, you will see in nursing that we unfortunately relate a lot of things to food because that's something that everybody can relate to. Um, so you'll hear us say things um, quite often that relate to food or other inanimate objects. So you can see here a 1cm would be the size of a Cheerio and by when I say that that's the outside of the Cheerio outside of the penny, the outside of the banana. You see how that opening is getting bigger and bigger. Okay, so talking about fetal lie and Leopold's maneuver. So the fetal lie is, um, what do I mean by that in the position? So what I'm looking at is, which way is this baby positioned inside of mom? Um, and how am I, how do I know which way, or what's going on, okay? Because I need to know if this is a head coming out first, if this is a butt coming out first, okay? I need to know if this is a shoulder coming out first. So this is an easy way to do it, is doing Leopold's maneuvers. So um, in the picture here on the right, you can see that mom is lying on her back, she probably has a pillow underneath one hip. Remember that supine hypertension. So we start at the top and we're feeling for, do we feel a butt? Then we're gonna feel down the sides, which side is the back on? And then we come down and hopefully we have a nice hard head there at the bottom, okay? Um, you can do this to say that this works 100% every time. Um, absolutely not. It would be someone who is very experienced, um, does this all the time with their patients because heads and butts are both very firm, okay? It's very hard unless your patient is on the thinner side to really tell the difference between a head and a butt, okay? Um, so sometimes that means that even um, if we examine our patient, we may not be able to tell if it's head at first or butt first. So we may actually have to get a sonogram machine and take a look. Um, so that is what we're doing with Leopold's maneuvers is it's a quick way of trying to see what do we have coming out first. Okay, fetal presentation and station. So I talked a little bit about this earlier, but what am I looking at? All right, so the, pay, the picture on the left um, that's the pelvic area, right? Those pelvic bones that that baby has to descend down into, okay? Um, so the, basically the way it is, is if that head is right, even with those um, ischial spines there, with those bones, then I'm at a zero station, all right? That means my head is engaged. Um, at this point, if something happens, I'm not going to go back up because once I get down there really good engaged that means my head is not it's not i'm not going to say stuck but it's firmly down in there i'm not going to be doing any um flipping or um you know turning around sometimes these little these little devils will do all kinds of stuff in there that they're not supposed to do okay um if i'm at a minus three that means that head is still up it's not in the pelvis um, pelvic area yet it's not in that that pelvic girdle, so to say, I suppose. Um, so 
then I can still do a lot of acrobats in there, okay? I can check my patient and this patient, the baby may be head down and the next time I come back, it's butt down and it's because baby's flipped. So those things can still happen when I'm at that negative station, okay? When I'm at a positive station, that means my head is on the way through, completely through those pelvic bones and now I'm going to start be able to see that head as I'm looking in the vagina for um, to check on my cervix and to see where baby is at. Okay, um, the picture on the right shows it just a little bit more. Um, so you can kind of see how that head will descend through that pelvis. Okay, fetal presentation and position. We're going to talk about this, but please. Please don't get focused on this. Um, this can be very, very confusing. Um, the important thing I want you to understand about presentation and position is we need to know which way is this baby coming out. Um, in this picture, it shows you um, things that the um, physicians will be looking for. And basically, in this picture, what they're doing is they're looking for which way is the baby facing, okay? So why do they need to know this? Well, because in some of these, um, the um, OP positions here, which are the top two, the right occipital posterior and left occipital posterior, that's what is called sunny side up, if you've ever heard that, that. Um, the way we want baby is really these bottom four pictures. They need to either be tucked in and facing sideways, but the best way are these two bottom ones where they'll be all flexed in and facing mom's back. Okay, so baby's face is facing mom's spine. Um, these are these bottom two are the easiest position um, to push baby out. The second two up, the right and left occipito transverse. Those are okay, it takes a little bit longer, but if baby's in that position, it's not so bad. The top two are much more difficult to push baby out. Um, and sometimes you'll end up with a baby that has lots of bruising on its face because of this. Um, so we will talk more about this in class. The important thing for you to understand is um, in presentation and position, I'm, that I want you to, to be aware of is um, is this baby head down? Is it butt down? Is it shoulder down? What's coming out first? Um, that's, that's the big takeaway from this slide. So my patient comes in and what am, how am I going to assess them? What am I going to do? So I'll put them on our fetal monitor that has those two um, transducers that I talked about. One was the TOCO that did the contractions. One is the ultrasound that listens to baby's heart rate. Um, and I'm going to look for the frequency, how often are um, the contractions. So we measure them from the beginning of one contraction to the beginning of the next contraction. So where one starts, um, I'm gonna count how many minutes until the start of the next one. That's gonna tell me how often. And then the duration is how long from the beginning of the contraction to the end. Um, typically, they're going to start shorter and they're going to become longer, um, usually up to about a minute or so. Sometimes in transition, you'll um, find that those con the, that duration may lengthen a little bit. Um, but um, other than that, usually about one minute is what they um, end up being. Um, so then my patient says how, uh, you know, I think my water broke. So how do I know that this is truly um, the bag of waters that have ruptured or is this something else? So um, some of the, the older ways of um, noting if the um, membranes have ruptured is by using nitrazine paper. So if you've ever seen nitrazine paper, um, it's on a, a small strip and it is it's actually paper you tear it off 
um, and get a piece of it. So what does this paper do? It measures the pH of um, different material. Whatever you put it into, it'll measure the pH of it, okay? Um, it starts green, and then as you touch it to um, what we would say is um, amniotic fluid, it should turn a dark, dark blue, um, sometimes a black. Um, that is tells us that she's nitrazine positive for um, fluid. Now, other fluids can cause um, the same kind of changes, so it's not a definitive. So our first step would be to do a nitrazine paper that gives us a quick way to know, is this really amniotic fluid or is it another substance? Um, the next thing we could do, and this is also, like I said, another, um, this is a bit of an older technique, is what's called ferning. So that's what this crazy looking slide is over here on the right. If you look at it closely, it looks like um, the palm, the fronds on a fern. Um, so the leaves on a fern. So that's why it's called a fern slide. So what we do is select, um, get a Q-tip and get some of that fluid um, out of mom. We put it on a slide. As it dries, that fluid turns in, it, it dries in this ferning pattern. So we then have to take that slide down to the lab. The lab looks at it underneath a microscope and then um, they will see this ferning pattern. Now, there's all different ways that this can go wrong, okay? Um, if your lab person isn't willing to look at the entire slide, you may only have ferning in one spot. So you may end up with a negative fern slide, meaning that there's no ferning on the slide and be actually ruptured. So some of this also includes your clinical judgment, all right? Um, we will note how much fluid is, is coming out of mom, what color is it, what time did it start leaking, all those kind of things. Now, the new um, way of testing this is by using, um, there's several different um, makers. One is AmniSure, one is ROM Plus, R-O-M Plus. Um, these are little kits that um, give you a up to like 99% accuracy of whether or not this is um, actually amniotic fluid. Um, so those are the newer things that they will be using to test with, um, but this is still mentioned in textbooks, so I wanted to mention it in case you, you heard these um, terms. Um, now, We'll talk a little bit more about baby being engaged in prolapse cords and all that kind of stuff in class um, because I think visually it makes much better sense than trying to explain it here. All right, so how do I assess mom and baby during labor? So um, it's much easier, as you could um, imagine, to assess mom than it is to assess baby. So that is why fetal heart tones and fetal heart rate um, is so very important when we are taking care of a mom during a mom and baby during labor. Um, that's our main way of knowing is this baby doing okay or not doing okay. Okay. Um, so our baby that um, has a heart rate that is what we considered abnormal then we would need to do some different things in order to assist that baby um, and mom. There are a few um, internal resuscitation things we can do, meaning while baby is still on the inside, there are some resuscitative measures that we can take to try to help until we can get baby on the outside. Um, so there are um, we definitely, while mom is in labor, um, every 15 to 30 minutes are going to be um, listening to baby's heart rate. If you've delivered in a hospital, you'll know that pretty much we put you on that fetal monitor and we want you to stay on that fetal monitor. So that's very important to us as labor and delivery nurses. That way we know what's going on with baby and when we need to intervene. Um, while many people are now delivering at home, so um, they are going to be assessing the fetal heart tones at a different rate. Um, but you always want to make sure you're, you're assessing 
the heart tones through contractions so you know what baby is doing and if there's something that's stressing baby out. Um, of course, we're always going to explain anything that we're doing and we want to make sure that we're taking um, maternal vital signs because mom's vital signs can very much um, affect what's going on with baby as well.